Welcome. It is the Currents Line Check and it's community uh, conversations with Minnesota's music community. And today we are talking about how to get a grant, opportunities and advice for Minnesota musicians. The current is a uh, uh, my name is Diane. I'm host of The Local Show, and we're sitting down with Minnesota musicians, artists, and friends at a look behind the scenes at what artists need to do to build and keep their careers on track. And this spring, we have been discussing an array of topics from social media to the financial side of the music business to what it's like performing during a pandemic. And you can keep registering for live virtual events or catch them at the current YouTube channel. Thanks for being here today. Um, recording music. And buying music equipment is expensive, and gigs, merch sales, they hardly allow uh, working musicians to stay afloat. But fortunately, there are organizations out here that exist that offer monetary grants and more to outstanding artists. And I'm here with two experts today, including a musician. And the experts that I have with us live are Minnesota Music Coalition's Executive Director, Joanna Schnedler, and Springboard for the Arts Artist Resource Director, Andy Sturdivant. And uh, hello, greetings. Thanks for being here today. Um, I want to start off by uh, letting, allowing you two to both kind of explain what it is that you do in the uh, this uh, professional industry of yours. And uh, let's start with uh, you, Joanna. Absolutely. Well, uh, my name is Joanna Shedler, as you mentioned. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Music Coalition. And I've been with that organization uh, for about two years. And prior to that was executive director of the Minnesota Theater Alliance, uh, which also supported uh, Minnesota's performing arts organizations and practitioners. Uh, my career goes back about 20 years in the nonprofit sector. Um, a lot of that being in fundraising uh, for social service and social enterprise organizations and uh, in front of house management for the performing arts. And Andy. Hi, my name is Andy Sturdivant. I'm the Artist Resources Director at Springboard for the Arts. Um, Springboard for the Arts is about a 30-year-old organization. I've been with Springboard for 12 years, so it's quite some time. Um, but Springboard has a very broad mandate. Essentially, we, we do professional economic and community development with artists, artists being anybody who self-identifies as an artist. So that absolutely includes musicians, but we also work with uh, you know, performing artists of all kinds, visual artists, really just about anybody that puts their hand up and says, I'm an artist, that's who we work with. And so within the organization, which again, has a somewhat broad mandate, I also have a somewhat broad mandate within that mandate. Um, artist resources is one of those terms that can mean any number of things from like, I need to talk to a lawyer, I need some money, I don't understand what this rent contract means, I need some assistance with X, Y, or Z. And so essentially my job is to, uh, find out how to address X, Y, and Z, uh, either personally uh, within the organization or with a partner organization. Um, and so that can take the form of anything from consultations to uh, workshops to just friendly phone calls to people that have something on their mind. Yes. With the pandemic still raging among us, I think a lot of artists are seeing their gigs get canceled or postponed. It's just the stress level is high. And having supportive organizations such as the Minnesota Music Coalition and Springboard Center for the Arts, um, there's several more that we could list of, of that that exist to support artists in in you know financially, but even as a community to kind of point them in the right direction. All these things that you've listed, like oh yeah, how do you how do you file your taxes? <laughs> Those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I think one of the big reasons why the Twin Cities has such a, um, a, a amazing music rich scene is because there are supportive organizations such as the two that you re both represent. Um, Joanna, can you uh, explain a little bit more about the Minnesota Music Coalition and delve into some of those um, like if you become a member of the Minnesota Music Coalition, what does that what does that mean? 
Absolutely. So the Minnesota Music Coalition is a statewide organization that serves mm -hmm. Minnesota's diverse community of independent musicians. And we do that uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, one being uh, that we have a, vet, a mentorship program so we can pair musicians up with uh, people who are more established in their careers for one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, we have uh, vendor discounts for our members to help them uh, manage their, their expenses. We have an annual conference called the Minnesota Music Summit, which is happening in just a couple of weeks, June 3rd through the 5th. Uh, that'll be uh, in St. Paul and we'll also be live streaming from Duluth and uh, we'll have some live performances in a few other locations, including the Mall of America. You can learn more about that. We're really excited about all the programming that weekend at mnmusicsummit.org. Um, and in addition, uh, the Minnesota Music Coalition has our Caravan de Nord tour that goes across greater Minnesota, bringing musicians showcases and uh, workshops and networking to musicians in all of those local communities that we hold caravan tour stops in. And we have a booking and referral program. Uh, last year, we, we booked over 300 performances. Those are paid performances of a variety of sizes and, and types across uh, the Twin Cities and in other greater Minnesota locations as well. And uh, we also are, are there at the table for conversations uh, in advocacy and in representing musicians um, in things like the Creative Minnesota Economic Impact Data Project. Andy, uh, I feel like the Springboard Center for the Arts is, has similar um, in, uh, offerings, but um, explain a little bit more about in detail of, of, of Springboard's Center for the Arts and what exactly y'all do. Sure. Um, we are uh, Springboard for the Arts. We're not a center. We're, we're all oh, over. Oh, sorry. Springboard for the Arts. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> Thank okay. you for the correction. Um, but that's, yeah. No, no, no problem because mm -hmm. it's... Um, we have offices in St. Paul, but we also have an office in Fergus Falls as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we work all across the state. Um, we have three folks up in Fergus, and then the rest of us are, are down here in St. Paul. Um, but, our, you know, our programming takes a lot of different forms. I think there's a couple that would, would maybe be of interest here. Um, we have a, a workshop series specifically called Work of Art that talks about a lot of the things that, that you all have been discussing in Line Shack for the last uh you know, a couple of months, um, a series of 12 workshops that are open to artists, performers of all disciplines um, that really break down a lot of the, you know, maybe less glamorous, but very important aspects of being a working artist or a working musician, including, you know, an entire workshop on um, grants and grant uh, making and, and funding. Um, in addition to that, we also do one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, we have a roster of about 20 just fantastic working artists um, that are available for one hour consultations. Most of those consultations are free. We have a wide variety of um, you know, partners that, that are able to pay the, the fees for those. So uh, you can typically get one at no charge. And we have, you know, among that group, a handful of working musicians as well. Um, and so those are great for people that are just looking for someone I really love the mentorship program, for example, that the Minnesota Music Coalition does. Um, and if you're looking for the first step towards that, the consultations can be great because it's an hour where you just have to talk about, you know, whatever is on your mind. And that sometimes is very specific. Like, I need some guidance on, like, you know, booking a tour and specifically what I should be checking off my list to very, like, expansive, like, oh, what do I do with my life? What's the meaning of making art in the world today? You know, we could do either of those things. Um, and, and a lot of people kind of fall somewhere in the middle there. But the, the consultations are just a great tool for people to, um, you know, kind of uh, have someone that, that knows the, the field to talk to. Um, and in addition to that, we, we also have a lot of other programs. Uh, one of the programs that I administer is the Minnesota Lawyers for the Arts program. Um, I am not myself an attorney, but I work with attorneys a lot. Um, and obviously, I think in, in music in particular, uh, it's really important to kind of understand fundamentally what your, your rights and responsibilities as a musician are. Um, and that can be a super intimidating thing, obviously. You know, you always feel like an attorney is like the kind of last ditch, you know, <laughs> it's like end of the line. I have to talk to an attorney now. And, you know, an attorney is, is someone that we want you to talk to earlier in the process, just so you have a sense for, you know, what uh, what some of the issues in play in your career might be. And so people could get a half hour phone consultation with an attorney for no charge um, and then, you know, get some legal assistance. So those kinds of professional development services are, are really a lot of what we do at Springboard. Amazing. 
grants. All right, let's get more into that. And um, to start off with, I want to air a uh, interview that I had with Paviel, who is a highly decorated artist in the music scene. Um, in fact, is has put on several amazing big performances, auditoriums. She plays at club gigs um, and has done a, a lot of great work in the scene. And, and um, she also has won two big um, grants, the McKnight Fellowship and the Jerome and I want to say there's probably some other ones in there. Um, and she's uh, kind of asked her to, well, let's let's run the clip. I have with me Paviel, who is a highly decorated artist and has won numerous grants, including the McKnight and the Jerome Fellowship, uh, very highly sought after grants and um, have um, opened a lot of doorways. And, and with us today are also a couple of panelists from organizations such as the Minnesota Music Coalition and Springboard Center for the Arts. Both are generous organizations that exist for artists to help them flourish. And and, and you're someone who's um, won numerous accolades and grants, including the McKnight and the Jerome. And I guess for people who are listening and, and want to learn more about grants, what can you tell them about about what to expect when to apply f when applying for grants. I had a different kind of story. I applied for grants millions of times, lost millions of times, and then finally got it. Um, mm. It was like, I think I applied, I want to say like five or six times to the midnight before I got it. Um, one thing is, I think if, if you would like to go into finding grants for yourself, the first thing is to find the ones that um, they, it, it's not a grant that is like beholden to something. If you are just starting out um, and I would say go for, you know, some of those, like there's some really good project grants and some smaller grants off top to start with. And I did that too. Like I started with a smaller amount before I started moving up. Um, but I also started with ones, you know, that were like, I could use them f to get computers and, and to get a machina, um, to be able to get, you know, things I need to create the work that I'm trying to get funded, um, and create work so that I have these work samples. Um, and so that's kind of just how I started. I was going for the smaller grants to be like, let me put together stuff and, you know, just saving up and purchasing stuff too on my own, um, just so that I can have the things I need to create what I need to create. And then once I um, did uh, a Requiem for Zula, I was given a grant through ACF, I believe, um, in, in conjunction with uh, SPCO to be able to get that done. And once I did that, I was able to sit down with somebody and just talk about all the things that I've done um, as an artist and they kind of just helped me format all these things. And it was just kind of like me just watching what people are doing and mm -hmm. watching, you know, how people are writing these things out, these work samples, how they are, um, reading the directions all the way, because I've lost grants for not reading directions, for sending files that are <laughs> not what they asked for, for sending Word doc and I was supposed to send PDF. I mean, like, it's it's just a bunch of things you have to go through to learn how to pay attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so once I started paying attention to all these things and paying attention to, like, how um, looking at other grants that people have won because you can have access to stuff like that. So it was a lot of personal research um, of mm -hmm. seeing how grants were made because I would have loved to pay to have somebody write a grant, but I don't have that kind of money on a risk um, mm -hmm. because it's, you know what I mean? Like, it's like if, yeah. if, if I'm a starving artist or, you know, I'm working and I'm working paycheck to paycheck, you don't have that kind of money to just give to somebody. So uh, you could research and just figure out how to put together your resume in, in you know, a uh, correct format, how to put together your artist statement um, in a correct format and have a couple of artist statements and have a couple of bios, have a short one, a long one that goes through everything, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I just started, I, I would go into GarageBand and cut my own work samples um, I would go find the clearest stuff or like go gig at Ice House and ask for the 
um, the recording back and oh, cut yeah. stuff up really, really good. Um, any of my shows and stuff. And I just kind of built my way up to getting these grants by researching how other people were doing them and looking at, okay, what got this person $25,000? What got this mm-hmm. person $50,000? You know, because now I'm like looking at creative capital grants, which are much harder um, because it's another step for me. Like, you, and that's the other thing, you just keep going up these steps, you know, because there's so much yeah. out here to gain. But every step that you go, they're asking more of you. And so that once you get into getting the grants that have specific things that you have to do to them, then you have to start getting into the planning, you know, and figuring Mm -hmm. out, okay, I have this project. I need to put together a project plan before I even sit down and look at this grant because they're going to want to know everything about it, even on the outcome before you even know. And it's like, you haven't even done this grant or this pro pro you know, this, this project yet. And it's like, how yeah. do I know? But it, it takes, it, it just takes that kind of time and that kind of thought um, to put into it. And that's what I did. I just kind of, because I work a full-time job and I have this career, I would just kind of put together 30 minutes a day. And I still do that to stay on top of my stuff. Like I'll sit down 30 yep. minutes a day and we'll write maybe, you know, five, six paragraphs about whatever it is that I'm trying to do. So that by the time I get ready because grants all have cycles, they all have seasons, they, you have an applying season, you have a winning season. And so mm-hmm. during the winning season, if I didn't win nothing, I applied during the, that season, before the applying season, I'm putting together all this stuff before I even know what grants I'm going to. Because it's it mm-hmm. gets harder. Um, and because it's such a huge competition and you're competing, out, once you step outside of like Minnesota grants, and you start looking at national grants like Creative Capital or, you know, um, any of these grants that are, you know, upwards of a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. It yeah. it ups the level of competition and of other artists that are just as bomb as you, um, or or even doper. <laughs> you know what I mean? That can that that you're up against, and right. so you're looking to be the most unique that you can be dealing with people that you know are amazing or that you can assume that you're up against that are amazing. Right. You know, so it's less, it's less competitiveness for me, but it's about how I can make myself better to be able to stand up there with that and be seen. Yeah. And then, gosh, once you get that, those funding, gosh, how much it helps uh, to actually be able to set aside time to, yeah. To write, because it's like nobody, like musicians can't afford nope. <laughs> off of gigs alone, like, or right royalties. Ooh, no, uh, that's why I got a full-time job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I'm doing Same. all this stuff, you know, but it means that yeah. much to me, because I just, I was a starving artist mm-hmm. in my 20s, and I understood what it was, mm-hmm. and it just, for the kind of person that I am, um, and and just my life overall, I have to have someplace soft to fall. And I have yeah. to be able to like take care of my health and my body and my mental health and all that. So that's why I work. Um, and it also pays off because I took a lot of gigs as a kid and as a young artist that I really did not want. Um, and I can be honest about that. There was times where I was crying before I had to go on stage. Um, it, and I remember that. And I mm-hmm. said, you know, when I get grown, <laughs> I'm going to work because nobody's going to, you know, have to, I, I don't ever want to have to be up against having to pay my rent and doing something that's hurting my soul to do that when I could just supplement and Mm -hmm. be able to just push through because I'm young and I can do this. (laughs) (laughs) When I'm old, I'm cool. I'm going to go retire and have my farm and I'll be okay. But while I got this youth in me, I can do this until, until in the universe says fly free now. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does seem like with grants, you know, yeah, they are competitive, but, you know, Ooh. you're right. Building up your resume, uh, building up your portfolio, keeping active in the scene, um, mm-hmm. studying up on yes. the organi- organizations are, are all really valuable things that can help you um, get Absolutely. your foot in the door with uh, get people's attention. Because, yeah, they have to go through so many <laughs> um, applications. So, yeah. yeah, it's like a way of how do you stand out? Yes. Um, anything that else that you would add as, as far as advice that you would give to folks looking to apply for grants, et cetera? Um, keep going, keep trying. 
Um, I've had mm -hmm. other artists reach out to me and tell me that same thing. And it's the only reason why I kept going seriously. Cause mm -hmm. I was just like, I'm good. You know, <laughs> I'm good. I had lost the, the McKnight at one year, the year before I won it. And I was just like, you know, let's just keep moving. But it was because of mm -hmm. another artist, another, another mm -hmm. sister artist of mine that called me personally who had won it herself and told me to keep going and to, uh, it, it, she said, it doesn't hurt you to continue to put in this application. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it, so it just doesn't matter. Just, just keep putting them in because they will see you. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that, and I hope that, you know, things are changing and I've seen, you know, a, a lot of changes, especially here in Minnesota um, with a lot of these, um, uh, community organizations that are supporting artists like Springboard um, that are trying to make it more equitable um, and trying to make the grant process more equitable um, and make it accessible to people who don't necessarily have all of the criteria who are brilliant artists and are mm -hmm. being stifled because they're not being seen. Um, and so I hope that this continues um throughout the organizations here and nationally that you understand who you're missing and what you're missing, the wonderful, awesome dopeness that you are missing by, um, by discriminate, discriminate, it's like, uh, discriminate, discrimination or like, you know, their policies right. discriminate and, and they are an inequitable in that sense, because, um, right. you know, not everybody has that. Uh, not everybody has the ability to put together stuff on their own. Like I just by chance knew technology. And so I know how mm -hmm. to work gradual and I have a computer to be able to do that. And, you know, right. I have, I can see the privileges and things that I have myself in order, you know, to be able to do this too. So that's why I'm really out here trying to talk to more organizations. And I've talked to ACF about this as well. Um, the American Composer Forum uh, about, changing the understanding on on who you need to be searching for with these grants and who you need to be opening it up to besides the usual suspects. Well, I appreciate all the work that you do in the community and 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 for sitting here in front of us right now and giving your advice to uh, people who are paying attention and watching. It's so valuable to everybody and including myself, including uh, music fans and uh, just people who are appreciative of, of uh, active community members. Um, thank you so much, Paviel, for being here.
That is the uber talented Moyes, um, a musician based out of here in Minnesota. And we've been spinning him on the local show. His two singles, Burn You Out and Cell Phone, Cell Phone Receiver. Uh, be on the lookout for that amazing artist. That was a really great unplugged performance by him. And we'll also feature a, another video at the end of the discussion. I again have here with me Joanna Schnedler and Andy Sturdevant, um, two expert panelists on grants. And um, you just heard a um, some dialogue with Paviel, who is a uh, another amazing, talented artist who has a lot of experience in um, in the field of the music industry, and um, of course, having won a few grants herself. I want to ask y'all a similar question that I asked to Paviel. Um, is that what can you expect when you apply for grants? And um, as someone who's maybe preparing and thinking about um, getting a grant, um, what is what is what are some of those things that we should they should be thinking about? Um, I'll start with you, Andy. Yeah, Paviel put it really well. Um, it, the trick with the grants, I think, is it, you apply for them all the time. I mean, it, yep. it's it's inevitable to apply for a lot of them, you know, before you get one. Um, so I think part of it is just in the preparation that the trick is to most grants have a more or less similar format for what they're looking for. It's not entirely, you know, uniform from grant to grant, but generally they're looking for some kind of information about you, you know, a, a who, a what, and a why. And they're looking for some specifics about a project that you want to accomplish. So, you know, and we can, we could really get in the weeds with like fellowships versus grants, but essentially they're just looking for a very straightforward kind of description of what you want to do, why you want to do it and when and how you propose to do it. Um, and so if you can get all of that material kind of ready to go, you know, like keep it in just a folder on your desktop um, and just have it ready to go, you know, a couple of times a year, um, that, that really goes a long way. And I think what Paviel said, too, about the, the prep, too, um, especially with grants that are made by public agencies like the State Arts Board or the Regional Arts Council, you know, that's all public information since it's a state agency. So you can actually call up the program officer, email them and ask to see a couple of sample grants. Um, and it, it really helps to read a few beforehand. Um, I mean, I think the best grants are the ones that are written like in a very non-jargony, very straightforward kind of way. But I think it can help you get a sense for the rhythm of like the language and, and the way that people talk about their work by, you know, just looking at as many grants as possible and not like imitating them, you know, line for line, but just, you know, getting a sense for like the the general vibe to use a, a very technical term we, we use in this field a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Joanna, uh, sa same question. What, what, what can people expect? Or... Well, I, I would also, you know, add to what Andy said in that uh, reaching out to program officers at the foundation, um, Many are really happy to have conversations. Many offer webinars, uh, which you can watch and ask questions there, or you can watch the recorded versions. Um, there's just a ton of resources um, for many of our, our general arts funders to help you at least know what to expect and what they're expecting. Um, I would also, this is kind of a, 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 brings us into a whole nother realm of grants, but I, I would also say it's worth doing a little bit of research on understanding um, what a fiscally sponsored project is. Um, you know, there are grants that are only available to individuals, and then there are grants that are available to organizations and fiscally sponsored projects. And uh, very quickly, a fiscally sponsored project is one that uses another nonprofit's uh, nonprofit 501c3 status in order to be eligible for that funding. Um, but if this is a project that you're doing with uh, more people, if you have um, you know, an LLC or a, a Minnesota nonprofit, and maybe you haven't become a, a larger nonprofit, um, or you have a project that is just, a, it's a bigger in scope than just you as an individual artist, you might want to think about exploring some of those options because they do give you the the opportunity to apply for another set of grants grants that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to bring up something that Paviel uh, addressed, and she said equi equitability. 
um, you know, I think a lot of people are concerned about, you know, I don't know how to write a grant. <laughs> and some mm -hmm. people aren't, don't think they're qualified writers. And it seems like being a skilled writer is like going to get you really far ahead. And, or they don't have access to the technologies, but they're amazingly talented artists. What are some of the ways that um, you think organizations can be more equitable and and now and even into the future? Um, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, yeah, I think Pavel had some really good points there because historically the, the way that you get a grant is, you know, with a very formal resume, with, uh, you know, an artist statement, with a budget. It, and to some extent, that's still true. But I, I think, especially with some of the um, the public agencies, like the State Arts Board and, and the Regional Arts Council, the Metro Regional Arts Council here in the Twin Cities, um, you've really gotten more away from, from that model. So, I, I mean, I personally, I would love to see a world where grants are you know, you can apply for a grant with like a video call, you know, you can just record a five minute video, three minute video of you talking about your work, what you do in your own words, and, and you know, have it be based on that and not some kind of preconceived notion of like what an elegant turn of phrase is in an artist statement. Um, so I think that's part of it. And I think part of it is, is all of us as artists and arts administrators is to keep like pushing grantors and saying like, what are you doing to make this process equitable? Um, you know, ask why. <laughs> um, but even aside from that, yeah, I, I think a lot of it, I, I don't think that people need to be, Paviel had mentioned hiring a grant writer, for example. That's probably not something that the vast majority of people need to do. I think putting a grant together is actually a lot easier than people might think it is. Um, it's it's a lot easier than something like doing your taxes. It's probably a lot easier than booking a tour. I've never booked a tour before, but I have a sense that that is probably logistically a somewhat complicated process. Um, it's easier than that. Um, it really is just kind of it's that who, what, why. You know, if you can effectively write in simple, non-jargony language who you are, what you do, and why you do it, like that's that's eighty percent of it right there. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that that Springboard helps with, that the the Minnesota Music Coalition helps with. You know, if if you um, if you would like to talk to somebody about this, we're available. And one more thing, Joanna mentioned the um, program officers too. Um, I think there's also a misconception that program officers are the people that are making the decisions about who gets the grant. That's not true. <laughs> the program officers are in charge of getting the best grants possible, the best applications possible in front of the committees that are making the decisions. So if you call any program officer, email them, fax them, stop by their office and bang on their window, um, they are some of the most patient, <laughs> wonderful people that I can think of. Um, Sherry Fernandez Williams at the State Arts Board, a, 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 true, a true saint. <laughs> um, but I mean, really give those folks a call out of the application season um, and, and just, you know, they're happy to give you tips. They're happy to kind of assist with, with some of the logistical things. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, grants, grants can be a very non-equitable way of deciding who gets money. Um, it's kind of a legacy system that we're stuck with in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I, I think there are ways to address that. Yeah. Joanna, anything you'd add to equitability? Well, I would add, um, Andy was mentioning that he wished that uh, funders would would take video submissions. And actually, recently, I have started seeing that option in a number of grants. So um, I'm, I'm optimistic that that is going to continue to become a norm, uh, having the option to, to do video. Um, the other thing that I would add is that, you know, the resources um, that, that Andy mentioned with the one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and our mentorship program, those also can be uh, utilized uh, to have somebody review your grant materials, um, you know, take a look at them. And, uh, you know, I always would recommend to anybody to have other people in your life uh, proof or read for, you know, the readability and read for, um, you know, what any any issues they might see in your grant. Um, and our organizations can both provide some of that support, too. Mm -hmm. can, can you uh, both give me some examples of um, projects that have gone on to be successful because of receiving a, a grant or help? I can let any, either you can jump in. 
I'll, I'll jump in really quick. Uh, I, you know, MMC uh, fiscally sponsors a few different projects um, on occasion. We don't do a lot of them like Springboard does, um, but uh, we uh, have had a couple in the last couple of years that have had, um, they became fiscally sponsored in order to apply for, for grants for projects. And those were both really exciting to me. Uh, the Voices in the Back series, uh, received MRAC grants um, to uh, do conversations about um, about and with uh, topics related to artists of color in the community. And, um, and then uh, the Minnesota Original Music Festival uh, in St. Peter, Minnesota, uh, they uh, were fiscally sponsored by us and, and wrote some grants uh, to the, the funders in their region specifically to make that uh, festival possible. Andy, do you, uh, do you and, have some examples? Yeah, it's for I, we were talking before we went on. The um, Metro Regional Arts Council um, just announced the winners of the Next Step grant today. The Next Step is an individual artist grant that is available. Um, and if you look down the list of the folks that received it and what they were working on, I think it gives you a great sense for some of the types of work. Um, you know, some of the types of projects that can be uh, that can be funded. I think it's important to make a distinction. We get more one distinct one more distinction between project grants and, and something like a fellowship um you know project grants tend to be the the grants that fund like a specific project that has a timeline whereas in paviel's case for example with the the mcknight fellowship that's awarded with more of a you know no strings attached like kind of for the totality of their artistic practice um but project grants are a great place to start and i think again if you look at the, some of the next step grants there is you know an artist that is traveling to Cuba for a one month residency to study improvisation on a viola. There is, uh, you know, another artist that is purchasing uh, equipment. Equipment is always a big one. Um, you know, funding here for making an audiovisual recording of some songs for virtual auditions. Um, so really any kind of project that is just out of your um, reach financially. And I think especially with with things like training, things like workshops, things for performance, things for equipment, um, you know, some of the grants that are out there can be a really good first step towards those things. I'm gonna turn uh, it to Paviel that uh, has a question for you both. And I think it's probably one that uh, a lot of people have a question for about so many projects are in the same vein. Like a lot of artists want to do the same things or along the lines of the same type things. And a lot of the verbiage and, and you know, same words and structures get used with this. And I'm trying to figure out right now how I can make my grants sound more like me as opposed to grant speak and how to... Um, be able to articulate what it is that I want to do in a way that says, I know that there's probably a, a thousand others that want to do this, but here are the main points on why I want to do this and, and just how to set that apart, you know, and how to, how to make it be flagged or something, you know, how, how do I, what do, what words do I use or what, what um, methods do I use to, to get my papers like highlighted? Like, yeah, we need to go back to that, even second round type stuff, but just to get past the first, get past the door. Um, you know, it, how, how do, what's the best way to set yourself um, apart when you know that you want to do the same great work that a million other artists want to do for their communities? <laughs> That's yeah. a great question. Um, yeah. This is going to sound a lot more cynical than it really is, but <laughs> one thing you can do is serve on a grant panel, you know, through a public agency, because you really see how a grant is selected. And, and I always tell people that they're writing a grant, imagine that the person reading this has already read 200 applications. They've been in a windowless, stuffy room for the last four hours. They haven't had lunch. They haven't had anything to drink. They're in a bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, again, it, that probably sounds more cynical than I wanted to, but, but I think typically when people are reviewing grants, maybe they're looking for grant speak, but I think more than all, they're looking for clarity, you know, and it, it, which is why I think if you can focus your application to just say in the most straightforward language possible, again, that this is who you are, what you do and why you do it without using a lot of like florid language or an idea of what you 
think grant speak should sound like, you know, just as long as I think you're clearly communicating what you want to do in very concrete terms. Um, I think that goes a really long way. Um, because again, a lot of the panels reviewing this, you know, they're reviewing hundreds of applications. And when you're reviewing that many applications, you're initially looking less for strengths and looking more for like red flags, you know, like, oh, this person didn't say anything about what they're doing, or this person like clearly didn't read the <laughs> instructions for the grant beforehand. So it's out, you know? Um, and so if you, if you kind of visualize a, a crabby person in a, in a windowless room, that's very hungry, like that will help you kind of, I think, refine your language in a way that, that will strip off a lot of the fat and really just get down to the like, you know, the lean, mean, like who I am, what I do, why I do it. Yeah, I would echo that. And even to go one step further, I often go back to the verbiage that is in the the application or the, the guidelines and make sure that, that my grant includes a lot of what they're saying there, that they it's reflective um, very clearly of what they have listed as what they would like to have um, to fund, uh, you know, and, and in some cases, in some uh, grants, they make that very clear that we will be scoring on these specific things. Okay, so I'm going to make sure that my response, they, you know, includes those three things because they will score for those three things. Um, and in some cases, the grant, uh, how they're how you rise to the top is not as clear as that. But again, I go back to the guidelines that they've put forth and, you know, are those, is, is that reflected in what I am saying? And sometimes, you know, it, it's as much, it's as blatant as like, I'm going to make sure those specific words in their funding priorities are in my proposal. Mm -hmm. I can also speak from my own experience. I uh, won the McKnight fellowship and I put a lot of hours into it. So it's it's like, especially if you're going to apply for something that's um, really big and, and it offers, a, you know, a big award, you really do have to, you know, put the time into it and read the fine details because it, it's so true. Um, but also like, you know, I also like put a ton of time into that cover letter, which is like having experience writing is definitely helpful. But like, when I think about my own writing, I think about using my heart and using my emotion and, uh, and this, you know, because every no two individuals are alike. So, you know, being exactly who you are um, and owning that is something that I would say uh, to people. And yes, being concise, being clear and to the point and not overloading people with information that might get, you know, um, yeah, thank you so much both to uh, Joanna Schnedler and Andy Sturdivant. Um, I'm gonna open it up to some questions from the audience. And before I do that, I wanna thank the uh, Clean Minnesota Clean Water, Land and Legacy Amendment for being a supporter. And thanks to Eric Romani and Tom Campbell and, and on production and The Current for uh, being a great supporters of this and making this all happen. Um, I have a question, uh, question here. Um, uh, Scar, he says, I'm with the Arkansas Arts Council and I am in the middle of revamping our grants because they are really like resume, statement, etc. And our artists are really struggling. I love the video idea. Why couldn't we do that? Is there a reason y'all don't? Uh, I've tried to create workshops on this, but getting, getting creatives in the door is hard. Any advice here? Um, and he also added, if we do a video application, do we need to maintain the blind panel review system that I've inherited? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> there's the, I mean, it, it, it's a slow process, I think, to, to head in this direction. I guess, the, I don't know, the thing that I would say maybe, well, first of all, great, great for, for the, the, um, the member of the audience for for taking this on um you know i think it would be a great idea for them to to reach out to other state agencies and, and kind of see what 
what the the barriers might be because yeah there probably are barriers around privacy around um you know the the blind application process um you know i think it's a lot easier for some of the private foundations to go in this direction just because they're not um not being state agencies are not beholden to a lot of the same um you know kind of strictures um but yeah, I mean, I, I think my advice to the, the 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 question asker would just be to to talk to as many other state agencies as you can and kind of find out what the thinking on this is. Because I guarantee, if you're having this conversation in Arkansas, they're having it in 49 other you know state agencies in, in one way or another. And and I, I would imagine that a lot of the the same questions are on people's minds. What do you think, Joanna? <laughs> yeah, you know, I would add that especially if a if a grant requires an artist sample of work that it, it kind of feels like the the privacy aspect of video is is irrelevant um but the other thing that i've seen i believe emrac does this that i appreciate is when they meet with their panels ahead of review they they ask for the panelists to read the applications based on the project that is set forth and not necessarily the the grammar or you know any you know m writing mistakes that i think there was a past where that would you know mistakes in in grammar or what have you would would throw out an application which is kind of ridiculous but um we're we're moving in a different direction now so um I, i'm thankful for that we do have a live audience here, and you are welcome to ask questions. I got uh, the computer right in front of me. Got two uh, great experts in front of us, so please ask. Um, I would also like to plug our next line check series, which is going to be on the art making process. And got two great guests, and one more to, to be announced: um, Monkwe and Dosi and Dosh. Um, two very reputable musicians in town that know a thing or two about creativity. And it's going to be a great conversation happening on June 15th. Mark your calendars. And again, this whole um, conversation will be uploaded to YouTube if you'd like to uh, tune in and take more notes on it. Could I it's easy really to forget quickly things. and Yeah, go ahead, Dredd. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I, I was going to say, um, you know, in terms of grant prospecting, you know, we've mentioned a couple of kind of the major funders for artists, uh, but both Springboard and the Music Coalition have resource pages that list out other grant funders as well. Um, so there are and there are tons of possibilities, including a number of emergency funds um, that you know, are, are out there. And um, so you should go to our, our websites to check those out. And that there are a whole nother range of funders that I'd encourage people to investigate that we really couldn't list on our websites that, you know, city funders, um, regional funders, um, and uh, that there's a lot of possibility in your, your local communities to um, do some unique projects that center the arts. Yeah, that's an amazing point because I think, you know, obviously there's arts grants for artists, right? But I mean, if you think about all the things that artists do, you know, all the things that we do in terms of, of working with communities, in terms of working with, you know, people's health and wellness, like there, there are potentially other grant resources that go beyond just like, you know, arts grants into areas like economic development that, you know, come through cities or, or places like that. So I, I think once you start thinking pretty expansively about, you know, who can fund this project, it doesn't necessarily just need to be an arts funder. It, it can be any number of types of funders. Yeah, um, I got a question from James. He says, where can I find a complete list of available grants? You kind of brushed on that a little bit, but is there like, is there a good way to go and, and, the location to explore these things yes i can <laughs> yeah so if you go to the springboard for the arts uh, website which is springboard for the arts dot org um if you if you actually just put grants in the um 
in the search line, uh, it'll take you to uh, a couple of grant pages. And there's, a, there's an overview that has many of the grants that are available for individuals. Um, other than that, your, um, your public library, um, there's a couple of grant databases that are subscription only that are free of charge for library patrons. I know in Hennepin County, for example, they have access. And I think most of the you know, library systems around the states have some level of access. So if you go to your library and, and, and ask to see a grants database, um, there are some there as well. Yeah, and and uh, for the Music Coalition, mnmusiccoalition.org, and the resources page there is where you'll find our grants lists. Um, and I would also add that um, I kind of follow the the uh, Minnesota Council on Foundations. Um, I get their newsletter and and get their um, updates because sometimes really unique things get announced on that. And that's been a really useful resource. Um, and the, you know, that both, both of our organizations and others like the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits will offer uh, workshops on grant prospecting from time to time. So you can look for those. Cool. Uh, doesn't look like there's any more questions. Thanks again to Joanna Schnedler and Andy Servant for being here and our musical guest, uh, Moyes and Paviel as our uh, uh, musician representative. We uh, got one more video for you and uh, thank you to the live audience for being here. Mm -hmm.